Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming out on a lovely spring day. Um, my name is Jason Yarn, and I'm the random agent introducing an author because uh, Fred Van Lenty's book, Ten Dead Comedians, is being published by Quirk, which is located down in Philadelphia. But I'm happy that I get to introduce Fred because I was a fan of his long before we even started working. Fred has been working in uh, comic books for years. He's written tons of Marvel comics, his own independent work, and the one thing that is a running theme through everything he's done is humor. And it's quite fitting that he's writing a book that involves comedians and their killing. Because, it, <laughs> because everything he does just ma meshes so well together with that idea. Um, a little bit more on Fred. I would say he's, um, he's a number one New York Times bestselling and award-winning writer of things like Odd is on Our Side, which he did with Dean Kuntz. And his books, Action Philosophers, were named a great graphic novel for teens by the American Library Association. <laughs> Uh, additionally, with his wife, Crystal Skillman, Fred wrote and staged the play King Kirby, which was a New York Times critic's pick. And he co-wrote the original graphic novel, Cowboys and Aliens, which was adapted into a major motion picture starring Harrison Ford and Daniel Craig. Now, for myself, when the, uh, my agency was working with Fred on something else, I found out and I said, I have to meet with him. And I tried not to be a fanboy and geek out, but it was very hard. And I was, but, but, since then, I've been so excited to be able to work and see him work up close. And I still go every Wednesday to the comic store and buy the stuff that he writes for Marvel, but it's been so exciting to watch him do his first novel. I know, you know, it's like, I get a support. You get a support the comic stores just like you support the libraries. So without further ado, Fred Van Lenty and 10 Dead Comedians. And that was terrific. Are we all first novelists? Is that like the theme? Oh, that's cool. <laughs> I didn't realize that. That's rad. Cool. Yeah, thanks, guys. And thanks to Penguin Random House for having me here uh, to talk about 10 Dead Comedians. Uh, it's very exciting. It's my first novel. Uh, I'm thrilled to come talk to librarians because one of my first jobs ever in high school was at the Chagrin Falls Public Library in the proud Cuyahoga County uh, Public Library. Says, no, I wooed when you said that. I was the one who wooed. <laughs> Uh, I was a page shelving books. Do, you, do they still call them pages? Oh, yeah. oh, cool, cool. I didn't know if that was an 80s thing. So Chagrin Falls, Ohio, and yes, that, that is the actual name of the town, Chagrin Falls, Ohio. That's the town that uh, Bill Watterson of uh, Calvin and Hobbes fame is from. So Chagrin Falls was a small town, and it is often the case in small towns, small differences get magnified, particularly for a kid. And if you kind of look like this, and uh, with a bull haircut, and the wrong shoes and the wrong jacket, you get picked on a lot. Um, and because Chagrin Falls isn't just a small town, it's also a very rich town, so no one wants to get their Izod shirt messed up. So these, this abuse is not physical, this is all verbal. Uh, and this is how I learned to love stand-up comedy. Because by the time I was in the, let's call it the fifth, sixth grade, long before I became a library page, I found that not only was I better at insults than my tormentors, if I could make fun of the attacking kid's haircut in a clever way, not only did I diffuse his attacks on me, the other kids started laughing with me and not at me just because it was a good joke. And eventually the attack stopped because they figured out I could give as good as I got. And I can't begin to tell you how empowering that was at that young age to learn that words have power. I don't need to tell you guys that, obviously. Uh, and about the same time, I discovered the golden age of 80s comedy on my parents' HBO screen. I loved Robin Williams, Eddie Murphy, Bobcat Goldthwait, Sam Kinison, Roseanne Barr, and many others. But my absolute favorite was George Carlin. I love the way he raised and lowered his voice to make an effect, the way he talked high and fast or low and slow, depending on the point he was trying to make. And I listened to cassettes of his albums like uh, Place My Stuff, Class Clown, Seven Words You Can't Say on Television, Words Have Power, uh, until the tapes literally broke. The, the, the cassette you know, just was too thin. And uh, I, I just hung on the way he spoke truth to power in such a hilarious way. He, he wasn't defending himself against bullies in a basketball court. He was attacking hypocrisy, politics, racism and more. Uh, that didn't mean I didn't incorporate some of his methods into my schoolyard self-defense act, of course. Even when I was a tween, I was like, I gotta get, you know, I gotta get up in that. Now, in addition to looking like a bookworm, I, I, part of that is because I am also actually a bookworm. Uh, so there's, you know, it's truth in advertising. Uh, <laughs> my parents lined the house with books. Uh, one summer I actually made a little extra money uh, cataloging them all according to the Dewey Decimal System. <laughs> which they just told everyone who came into the house. They were so proud, so thank you, <laughs> librarians, for letting me pick up some extra cash in addition to the, to the page work. Uh, my mother's favorite books were mysteries, and 10 Dead Comedians is dedicated to her. 
Uh, she loves the classic Agatha Christie, Dorothy Sayers stuff. I'm more of a, uh, a Raymond Chandler type, so I was thrilled to find out our green room uh, across down the hall here is the Raymond Chandler meeting room, which uh, was pretty cool. In addition to the Cuyahoga County Public Library System coming up earlier, so this day is just full of kismet. Uh, you know, but like all great genres, the mystery can be more than the sum of its parts. You know, it, it, it can be quote unquote literary as well as entertainment because, you know, at its heart, it, obviously mystery is about investigation. It's about peeling back the layers of society to see what's there because it also speaks truth to power. Um, you know, in many ways, Oedipus, one of the first, you know, literary works uh, in history was a mystery, right? It was, why is this plague infect infecting the city? And of course, in the film uh, Crimes and Misdemeanors, Alan Alda says that, uh, you know, Oedipus is also one of the first comedies. Who did this the city? Oh, it was me. Uh, comedy is tragedy plus time is the sort of the famous line that came up from that. Now, Agatha Christie's novel, And Then There Were None, was published here in the United States in December 1939. Uh, that was not the original title when it was first published in England. I'm not going to say the original British title because you will start throwing things at me. Uh, because words have power and not all those words are, have uh, positive power. So go to the Wikipedia page if you want to see what the original title was. But uh, I have read that Christie had the idea for the basic premise uh, uh, for And Then There Were None long before she sat down to write it. Uh, the basic idea, if you don't know, revolves around 10 people being lured to a deserted island where they're killed off one by one uh, in methods that seem to be predicated by an English nursery rhyme, 10 little Indians. Uh, it, it sort of takes the classic idea of the locker room murder mystery, which seems impossible to pull off, and adds an even greater layer of impossibility to it by postulating that one of the 10 potential victims is the killer, and the other victims have to figure out who that person is before they themselves are murdered. Apparently, Christie had this idea rattling around in her head for a while, and she knew it was a great one, but it took her a while to commit it to paper because it was such a great idea, she had a hard time believing someone hadn't gotten to her first. So she did some research, and uh, once she determined that no, she had stumbled across black gold first and no one had drilled it yet, uh, she wrote the book, and you know, I'm sure she was happy she did because in her long career, it's, it's uh, generally considered her masterpiece. It's not just one of the best-selling mysteries of all time, it's one of the best-selling books of all time, period. Uh, but I had the same feeling as her when I was first sitting down with Quirk Books uh, to talk about 10 Dead Comedians, which is the same basic idea of And Then There Were None, except instead of stiff, upper-lipped uh, British types, you have stand-up comedians of various backgrounds as potential su suspects and victims. And like Christie, I was surprised no one had tried to marry comedy in the murder mystery before. Beyond, you know, mysteries are also essentially comedies like the movie Clue and Murder by Death and that sort of thing. Um, primarily, I'm so surprised that no one had done it before because so much of the language around stand-up comedy is are metaphors for violence. You know, if you do really well at a stand-up set, you killed. You slaughtered the audience. If you did poorly, you bombed. You died on stage. It's a real killer, kill, uh, it's a real killer be kill vibe in the comedy club, or maybe Predator and Prey, and I don't know which one is which. If you're as terrified by public speaking as most people are, this life or death language isn't so surprising. The audience is fickle and unpredictable. It's dangerous. It can turn on you at any moment. And you've got to be able to read the room and adjust your act accordingly or your show biz lifespan is not going to be very long. Maybe lion taming is the better comparison. So to this lonely island in the Caribbean come eight comedians, all of whom are familiar types perhaps, but unique in their own ways. There's a retired late night talk show host, there's a Vegas insult comic who's had one too many facelifts. There's an up and coming star who suddenly seems on every TV show and in every movie trailer at the same time. And a guy on the other side of the fame parabola trending downward who can barely get work as an improv instructor. There's the prop comic with the sledgehammer everyone looks down on and the hipper than thou alt comedian who looks down on everyone else. There's an urban road comic who's lived out of hotels for the past eight years as he goes from club to club and a blue collar comedian multimillionaire who hasn't seen the inside of a trailer park since the first Bush administration, despite his good old boy shtick. They're there at the invitation of a ninth comedian, one of the most famous who ever lived, but whose career got sidetracked by appearing in a lot of really bad comedies where he was married to a cat. <laughs> his assistant in an up-and-coming comic, who's the tenth in our cadre, leads them there and acts as surprised as the rest of them when they find that the island and its mansion are deserted. Now, I don't want to give you uh, too much more of a plot synopsis than that. It's a pretty short book. The original, and then where none, was 50,000 words. This is about 
half as long as that. I also write as fast as I talk, so, <laughs> so that has something to do with it. But, uh, but suffice to say, yes, the comedians start getting knocked off one by one, and yes, one of them did it, and no, you're not going to be able to figure out which one. <laughs> no, I mean, seriously, you won't. I can say that because, you know, I'm the writer, so I hold all the cards. Trying to figure out a mystery is like trying to win at three-card Monty. The whole thing is rigged against you from the start. If you prevail at, at three-card Monty, it's not because you won, it's because the dealer screwed up. But I hope you enjoy it. Uh, in my totally unbiased opinion, it's a really fun book, <laughs> and it's really funny. Uh, but what pleased me uh, so much about doing it was because it was a mystery, I was able to explore and investigate the lives and motivations of folks who do stand-up comedy, uh, people from different generations, different backgrounds, races, genders, sexual orientations, from widely disparate success levels, people who, have, who brave hostile crowds, bad weather, crummy food, living out of hotel rooms, bombing, and one guy, spoiler alert, literally bombs. Uh, sorry, I probably shouldn't have told you that. Uh, that. That is what mysteries can do that other genres can't. It lets you peel back those layers to see the beating heart underneath. And I wanted to see them put their humor skills in use of their own self-defense, as I did back in Chagrin Falls, though perhaps a bit more literally than I did. Uh, the stakes are higher. It's not really a comedy. It's more of a tragedy with jokes. Uh, and in doing so, I was able to marry two of the great loves of my life, the spoken word in the form of comedy, stand-up comedy, and the written word in the form of the novel. Uh, and as the guardians of words, you guys, I really appreciate you taking the time to listen to me today. Uh, it's a form of page. It means a lot. Thanks a lot.